All right. Um, good evening. How's everyone doing? Let me try again. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. Uh, welcome to the People's Forum. My name is Jordan Camp. I'm director of research here. I'm also a visiting scholar in the Center for Place, Culture, and Politics. And I'm really um, thrilled to welcome you here this evening for tonight's launch of Jody Dean's newest book, Comrade, an essay on political belonging, which is out from Verso. I just let everyone know this is being live streamed. So when you ask questions, let me know that uh, adjust them accordingly, if you like. Um, and before I uh, introduce Jody, I also want to point out that Word Up and our friend Taylor there has copies of Comrade, which they would be thrilled to sell to you. I hope you will consider purchasing a copy to enable us to continue to do free public programming with radical intellectuals doing cutting edge um, scholarship and, and writing. Um, tonight's event is a part of a spring lecture series that I'm thrilled to host here at the People's Forum. I just want to take a few moments before I introduce Jody to draw your attention to some of the events. Um, we recently had stirrings. Tonight's event is obviously about Comrade. In two weeks, uh, Christina Heatherton will give a talk entitled How to Make a Dress About Domestic Labor radical internationalism and the radical pedagogy of Elizabeth Catlett, which is special for us at TPF because we have an Elizabeth Catlett art space that some of you may have been in downstairs. And so if you don't know about Catlett, I really encourage you to come uh, check it out. And that's on the 29th at 6.30. Uh, we also are gonna have an event in March with Mary Louise Patterson about the book Letters from Langston, which are letters from Langston Hughes to her parents, William Patterson, Louise Thompson Patterson, luminaries on the left uh, in Harlem in particular, but they were global internationalists. Um, and there is a chance that Louis Messiah uh, will join us, the great filmmaker um, who made a film about Louise Thompson Patterson. Um, we also will host a talk uh, called on the book, The Common Win by Julia Scott in dialogue with the historian Marcus Rutiker, that's on May 14th at 6.30. Uh, we'll have Richard Pithouse as well, uh, Sam Stein. You can find out details about all of these events on the People's Forum uh, website. So last but not least, I'm really happy to be introducing this evening's speaker, Jody Dean. Jody is a professor of political science at Hobart and William and Smith College here in New York. She's the author of many books, too many for me to uh, list, but they include Crowds and Party, The Communist Horizon, Blog Theory, Democracy, and Other Neoliberal Fantasies. And tonight, of course, she'll be talking about Comrade. And it's really a pleasure to welcome you here to TPF, uh, Jody. I've been uh, particularly excited about tonight's talk. I mean, as all of you know, I think it's particularly fitting for her to be here because she's committed to elevating the visions of political and social movements and to implementing socialist futures. So for these reasons and many more, um, please feel welcome here at TPF. So join me in welcoming Jody. Thanks, Jody. So I'm um, checking the visuals and Great. Um, thank you guys so much for coming out to, um, tonight. I appreciate it. And I'm really thrilled to be invited to um, um, give a talk here. Um, this is my first time in this space, and it's mind-bogglingly fabulous. Like, I just can't even believe like, that, like, there's this much left capacity. It's just like, oh my god, the, you know, another world is coming. It's really sort of like great. And the, I just find the whole space just, just really, really inspiring. So um, my comments tonight are are going to be structured in three parts. And um, you know, I'm going to be basically trying to talk about some of the themes from my new book, um, Comrade, and have three parts. First, I'm going to explain the origins of the term. Then what I'm going to do is compare and contrast the comrade to other figures of political belonging or other, ki other categories of belonging. And then I'm going to make an argument for the advantage of comradeship over another kind of relation on the left, um, that between allies. And I'm going to make an argument for comrades. So let me begin then 
with, um, the, with an etymology or a history of the term. In Romance languages, comrade first appears in the 16th century to designate one who shares a room with another. In French, the term was originally feminine, camarade, and, it ref and, the word, and the word referred to a barracks or a room shared by soldiers. In Spanish, according to a linguistic dictionary, camarada is someone who is so close to another man that he eats and sleeps in the same house with him. So we have the idea then of comradeship as involving a space and a relation, or a relation that comes from sharing a space, right? That comes from the kind of intensity that's generated by being close to another person. We can actually go back even earlier in this little history and um, find the origins of this barracks term, camarada, um, coming out of Latin um, and the Latin word camera, which means room, chamber, and vault. A vault lets us think about the, um, the way that there's a function that comes about of producing a space or producing a structure and holding it open. So a chamber or a room is a repeatable structure that acquires its form right through this vault. And it acquires a form by separating an inside from an outside and providing a relation of supported cover. Right? So the room supports or covers those who are within it. Sharing a room, sharing a space, generates a feeling and an expectation of solidarity that differentiates those on one side from those on another. So this etymology lets us define comrade as a generic figure for the political relation between those on the same side of a political struggle. Comrades are those who tie themselves together instrumentally Right? We tie ourselves together for a purpose. If we win, and we have to win, we have to act together. Now, the term comrade functions in three ways. As a term of address, as a carrier of expectations, and as a form of political belonging. So as a term of address, comrade replaces gendered and hierarchical designations, right, Mrs. or doctor, and it replaces those with one that's egalitarian, as comrades were all the same. Correspondingly, those who address each other as comrades share expectations of each other, right? Comrades have to be able to count on each other, even when we don't like each other and even when we disagree. And there's some wonderful examples in one of my absolute favorite books, which is The Romance of American Communism by Vivian Gornick, which is actually being re-released by Verso, I think, this month. Um, and in the book, um, she reports the words of a former member of the, of the CPUSA, someone who just hated the daily grind of selling papers and canvassing, right? The kind of basic stuff that's required of party, party members. But the uh, comrade says, but nevertheless, I did it. And I did it. Because if I didn't do it, I couldn't face my comrades the next day. And we all did it for the same reason. We were accountable to each other. Finally, comrade points to a relation of political belonging. And here, it's different from a term like militant, right? Militant designates a person's individual political intensity. In, co in contrast, comrade points to the relation between or among militants, right? And that's necessarily collective and shared. Now, I'm going to um, show a clip now um, from a movie that I talk about in the book. And it's Ernst Lubitsch's uh, 1939 film, Ninochka. Let me set this up a little bit. Um, it's the scene in the movie where um, Greta Garbo first appears. And, um, and what's happening is she's, um, there are these three minor Soviet trade officials. And, they, and their names are Iranov, Bolyanov, and Kapalsky. And they're in Paris um, because they're trying to sell jewels that have been confiscated from Russian aristocrats. But, oh no, they're in Paris, so they've become all bourgeois and been corrupted by the decadence of Paris. And now, and so now they, you know, they started wearing tuxedos and eating fancy food, and so Moscow is unhappy about this and has sent a comrade you know, to Paris to straighten out these guys and to get them back on the, on the right path. So in this scene that we're about to see, um, Iranov, Bolyanov, and Kapalsky have gone to the train station to meet the comrade from Moscow. Well, this is a fine thing. Maybe we've missed him already. How can we find somebody without knowing what he looks like?
That must be the one. Yes, he looks like a comrade. Yes. Heil Hitler. Hitler. No, that's not him. Positively not. So what are we going to do now? I don't know. What is this? Is, it's we, must, we, must, we, we must have missed him. I'm looking for Michael Simonovich Ironov. I am Michael Simonovich Ironov. I'm Nina Ivanovna Yakushova, envoy extraordinary, acting under direct orders of Comrade Commissar Rosinin. Present with your colleagues. Comrade Polyanov. Comrade. Comrade Kopatsky. Comrade. What a charming idea for Moscow to surprise us with a lady, comrade. If he had known, he would have greeted you with flowers. <laughs> Don't make an issue of my womanhood. We're here for work, all of us. Let's not waste any time. Shall we go? Porter, here, please. What do you want? May I have your bags, madame? Why? He's a porter. He wants to carry them. Why? Why should you carry other people's bags? Well, that's my business, madame. That's no business. That's social injustice. That depends on the tip. Allow me. <laughs> <laughs> so anyone could be their comrade, but not everyone. Right? Some people are clearly not comrades. We are not all on the same side. Comradeship involves a relation of political belonging, the relation between those on the same side of a struggle. And a lot follows from this understanding of comradeship. Most importantly, shared expectations for action and political equality. In the anarchist, socialist, and communist tradition, this is where the liberating and utopian power of comradeship comes from. So I'm going to give a few examples. Right? The Bolshevik revolutionary Alexandra Kollontai pointed out that capitalism tears people apart, making them competitive, self-interested, and afraid. Communism abolishes these conditions and creates new ones where all workers are comrades above all else. For Kollontai, comradeship is a mode of belonging characterized by equality, solidarity, and respect. Collectivity replaces isolation, egoism, and self-assertion. It makes people capable of freedom. The Russian word comrade, tovarish, is masculine, yet its power is such that it liberates people from the chains of grammar. And the reason I say that is the same word, tovarish, is used for in a masculine and a feminine way. Right? It doesn't, it doesn't get a gendered in, ending. It's the same. Like, there's this um, Soviet book on literary language that was published in 1929, and that's when the, the kind of re vocabulary of revolution was still new. And one of the, the examples in the book is like the comrade sister because they think it sounds so crazy because it's this masculine modifier over a feminine word. But in fact, you know, it, the revolution doesn't need to have gender. It can like, break this apart. And so it sounded um, strange, but it, it, it brought with it the emancipatory ideals of the revolution. Um, Maxim Gorky, um, he's, um, he also gives us a way of thinking about this utopian energy in the word comrade, and he associates it with liberation. He has a short story called Comrade, and um, in this short story, he presents it as a word that had come to unite the whole world, to lift all men up the summits of liberty and bind them with new ties, the strong ties of mutual respect, end quote. Right? That's his language, that's not mine. Um, and in his story, he describes this high hostile, miserable, violent city where people are all humiliated and angry, where the weak submit to the strong. And he says, in the midst of all of this suffering, one word rings out, comrade. And the people cease to be slaves. They refuse to submit. They become conscious of their strength. They recognize that they themselves are the force of life. He gives the example of a prostitute who feels a hand on her shoulder and then weeps with joy as she turns around and hears the word, comrade. With this word, she's addressed not as a commodity to be used by another, but as an equal in common struggle against the very conditions requiring commodification. In Gorky's story then, comrade marks the difference between the world of misery we have and the egalitarian communist world that will be. 
Franz Fanon, I don't know if y'all can see this one. Yeah, Franz Fanon, um, the revolutionary and philosopher from Martinique who participated in the Algerian liberation struggle, also brings out the egalitarian and utopian dimension of comrade. In the conclusion of Wretched of the Earth, Fanon appeals repeatedly to his readers as comrades. Come comrades, the European game is finally over. We must look for something else. And in the last line of the book, for Europe, for ourselves and for humanity, comrades, we must make a new start, develop a new way of thinking, and endeavor to create a new man. Comrade is the mode of address appropriate to this task. It's egalitarian, generic, and in a context of hierarchy, fragmentation, and oppression, it's utopian. It's an invitation to a common project. One more example, in the 1930s, the Communist Party of the United States wasn't always successful in its efforts to eliminate bigotry and in the language of the time, white chauvinism. Yet it embraced an egalitarian ideal of comradeship. The black communist labor organizer, organizer Ernest Rice McKinney tells a story about leaving a meeting that happened in Pittsburgh. He writes, we were walking down the street, black and white together, and there were some black men walking with white women. We were in a tough working class district. And as we passed a group of white youth, they said to us, hello, comrades. Their tone was sarcastic, but not hostile. They assumed, were we, they assumed we were communists because the communist had made such an impression by practicing social equality, end quote. McKinney's story brings home the way the term comrade carried even for those who weren't comrades. It carried expectations for practical action, actions that demonstrated a full commitment to full equality. Comradeship manifests in deeds. So again, US co communists were not always successful in practicing social equality, but the expectation of comrades, which was powerful even when it wasn't fulfilled, was radical egalitarianism. Comrades were those not only courageous enough to practice a mode of belonging deeply at odds with the prevailing culture, but dedicated enough to recognize how personal relations help produce political power. So I've been you know, trying to bring out this egalitarian dimension um, of comrade. Now I want to differentiate comradeship from other forms of political belonging. And I'm going to, um, or other forms of belonging, and I'm going to emphasize four different ones. Kinship, um, being a neighbor, citizenship, and friendship. The relation be com between comrades is not a kinship relation. One is not born a comrade. It's a relation that's not the same as relations between brothers and sisters and parents and children and spouses and cousins, right? Kin or relatives, relatives oppose, can and do often oppose each other politically, right? We can be related by blood without sharing a politics. Um, and the same holds true for marriage, right? People can be spouses without being comrades. Um, like um, Frida um, Carlo famously said of Diego Rivera, whom she married twice, Diego is not anybody's husband and never will be, but he's a great comrade. Um, in her history of the British labor movement, um, which is called Comrade or Brother, the author Mary Davis observes, comradeship builds on fraternity but transcends it. So the ease of calling someone brother in predominantly male unions expressed solidarity, but it also gestures to challenges that labor has faced when, with respect to race and gender. To address another as comrade is not the same as addressing them as brother or sister, which immediately requires assigning a gender, assigning a gender identity. Right? Brother and sister also rely on a kind of familial imaginary whether it's that of the nuclear family or a kind of extended family or humanist brotherhood or family of man. Unlike the familial versions where often there's a rivalry, a rivalry um, between brothers or between sisters and sometimes as, as a desire to overturn, replace, or maybe even possess or devour the parents, comrade denotes a kind of flat equality, sameness, impersonality, and reciprocity. 
There's not a desire to outdo, but to support and be supported. A desire not to let others down and not to be let down, right? The desire is for collectivity. So the comrade's not the same. It's not the same as a kinship relation. Likewise, a comrade is not the same as the neighbor. Um, living near someone does not make that person your comrade. You can be part of the same locality, the same community, the same neighborhood without being comrades. It's not a spatial relation that comes from the proximity of where you dwell, right? It doesn't come from just accidentally coming into contact with others. Um, in fact, there's something sort of really interesting about the difference between the, the presumption of being next to someone that neighbor has and the kind of mobility or motion or even rootless cosmopolitanism that has been associated with communism and communist internationalism. And in fact, for some, it's this non-localizability which makes them suspicious of comrades because comrades might have tighter relations with those who are far away than they do with those who are right next door. Um, the comrade is also not the same as the neighbor understood in a kind of ethical sense, right? It, you would never say something like, love thy comrade as thyself, because comrades don't love themselves as uniquely special individuals. We subordinate our individual preferences to political goals, right? Our relation to each other is outward facing, oriented toward our project, right? To the future we want to bring into being. So we cherish one another as shared participants and instruments of a common struggle. The comrade's not the citizen, right? Citizenship is a relation mediated by the state and comradeship exceeds the state. It, we do not take the state as our frame of reference. Comrade does not designate everyone born, born in or residing in a specific territory, right? We find comrades all over the world. The early 20th century US socialist magazine titled Comrade is really interesting on this score because it collected all sorts of different letters and speeches and articles and writing from European socialists. And at the time, the US socialists were not yet members of anything like an international, but they still were affiliating themselves with a new international political movement. Comrade's rupture of citizen also manifests when we note how the state fears that communists are traitors, people with loyalties to an organization that aims to overthrow the state. In the United States during the Cold War and today in right-wing rhetoric, Comrade is used, um, often used sarcastically and derogatorily to accentuate the dangerous otherness of comrades. So comrade and citizen stand in an antagonistic relation to each other as the discipline of the comrade actually comes to take the place or substitute for the law of the state. The relation between comrades is also not the same as the relation between friends. Um, and this, can, this is a really crucial point today and it can, give rise to problems because we have we often are in small left milieus that can start to seem exclusive or cliquish people who might otherwise recognize that they are on the same political side might not come together because closed and unwelcoming friendship groups prevent them from feeling a sense of commonality and belonging Conversely, personal animosities that destroy friendships can undermine the political work of comrades. Right? Comrades may be friends, but friendship and comradeship are not the same thing. And we see this most clearly when friendships fray. Right? Personal dislike does not mean that the person is not a comrade. In tight associations, comrade and friend relations blur and overlap, and maintaining the difference between them Keeping the kind of distance between them actually takes work and it's important work because comradeship can require a degree of alienation from the needs and demands of personal life that friends have to attend to. I want to use an example from um, Frank Wilderson's book, Incognito. And Frank Wilderson is um, an important contemporary Afro-pessimist theorist who was involved in the armed struggle in South Africa. Wilderson, in his, in his book, Wilderson describes long hours discussing politics and literature with Trevor, 
who is a white South African, who was his student, as well as his comrade in, the, in an underground um, armed MK unit. Wilderson writes, I once told Trevor that he was the best friend I'd ever had. Trevor responded that he doesn't have friends, only comrades. <laughs> now, Wilderson says that he doesn't know what to make of this, but we might consider that maybe Trevor was rejecting the preferential singularity of friendship. He was rejecting this relation that dwells apart from politics. The absorbing work of political struggle creates its own intimacies, its own attachments and intensities. Comrades are bound <coughs> through work toward a common goal, not through work toward something merely personal. Wilderson reports on another discussion, this one with his first wife, Kanya, who is a black South African woman. Kanya says to him, you have many white friends, but you hate them all. Comradeship abstracts from the specificities of individual lives, from the uniqueness of lived experience, but friendship doesn't. Wilderson's friends remain white, he remains black, and he can hate the whiteness of his friends and his friends for their whiteness in a way that's deeply personal and wrapped up in life and being. But comradeship is different. It's about the politics, the struggle, the discipline of common work, and the deep sense of connection and accountability that results. Now this distinction between the comrade and the friend kind of illuminates a sort of inhuman dimension of the comrade, right? Because comradeship has nothing to do with the person or with personality in its specificity, right? It's generic. It abstracts from the specifics of individual lives to consider how these specifics might contribute to collective goals. What matters is not the uniqueness of a skill or experience, but its utility for party work. In this sense, the comrade is kind of liberated from specificity, freed by the common political horizon. The historian Ellen Schrecker makes this point in her fantastic book that's an account of anti-communism in the United States. And she says that during the McCarthy period of communist per, uh, persecution, there was a common assumption that all communists were the same. Communists were depicted as puppets, cogs, automatons, robots, even slaves. In the words of one of the kind of professional witnesses of the McCarthy era, people who became communists were no longer individuals but robots. They were chained in an intellectual and moral slavery that was far worse than any prison. Now, that's crazy and exaggerated, but there's a kind of small underlying truth um, which is the generic quality of comrades, or of comradeship as a disciplined and disciplining relation that exceeds personal interest. Comradeship isn't personal, it's political. Now I'm gonna move to the um, last section of my um, talk tonight where I make an argument to try to show why comrade is better than ally as a mode of left political belonging. Now, I would expect that most are probably familiar with the term ally as it's come about in contemporary activist circles, right? It's used a lot, but it's pretty fraught. And there's lots of intense discussion on social media and among community organizers about who can be an ally. Most generally, in this discussion or in these discussion, allies are understood to be privileged people who want to do something about oppression. They may not consider themselves as, as survivors or as victims, but they want to help. So typically, allies are understood to be straight people who stand up for LGBTQ people, understood as white people who support black and brown people, as men who defend women, and so on. I actually have never seen the term used for rich people involved in working class struggle. Allies don't want to imagine themselves <laughs> as homophobic, racist, or sexist, right? They see themselves as good guys, as part of the solution. Now, as is frequently um, emphasized in debates around allyship, claiming to be an ally doesn't make one an ally, right? It requ allyship requires time and effort. And so much of the stuff that's written about this is instructional, like a how-to guide or a pointers, how to be a good ally, right? It's like, it's like many lifestyle manuals or techniques for navigating but not demolishing privilege and oppression. So individuals are supposed to learn what not to say and what not to do, and so that they can feel engaged actually without any organized political struggle at all. 
The politics that we start to see in these allyship how-to guides tends to consist of interpersonal interactions and individuated feelings, right? The guides target the potential allies' individual attitude and behavior because that's understood as what is supposed to change. So I'm going to give a bunch of examples of this to try to, um, I hope that some of them resonate with things that you've heard or that you've seen before and sort of to remind folks of how this, these discussions have gone. So um, there was a BuzzFeed post entitled, How to Be a Better Ally. And in this one, um, the author writes, have you ever had a conversation with a feminist man come grinding to a halt because he starts to complain about how feminists use language that excludes men, even the feminist men, like not all men? I have. Being a good ally often means not being included in the conversation because the conversation isn't about you. It's good to listen. If you feel uncomfortable and excluded because you're white, you should own those feelings. What do we see in this? We see allyship figured as a disposition, a confrontation not with state or capitalist power, but with one's own discomfort. To be an ally is to work on being a good listener, to step aside and to become aware of the lives and experiences of others. Those are good things to be aware of, but think about the fig how politics is understood. It's understood as what the individual does, not how do you build power and how do you overthrow the state. Another example, it's called the fund from the, something called the Fundamentals of Effective Allyship. And this one considers allyship in terms of the intensity of the ally's feelings and whether the ally is willing and able to undertake the necessary self-work. Quote, it's our responsibility to recognize, identify, and act on the privilege we have. One of the ways of doing so is committing to an ongoing act of introspection, reflection, and learning. You will find yourself challenged, uncomfortable, even defensive, but the more intense these feelings are, the more likely it is you're on the right track." End quote. So acting on privilege is something one does to oneself. One's politics might be completely in one's head. In this respect, we can say allyship reflects a kind of shrinking of the state of the space of politics to an individual's feelings. The field of action has decreased, yet the ally rightly feels the need to act desperately and, and they feel it intensely. And so they act on what they see as available, right? Themselves and then also usually social media. A third example. This is from the online magazine Everyday Feminism. And it was a, uh, <laughs> and this was a list of 10 things allies need to know. And number five on the list is allies educate themselves constantly. And, the, and it's glossed like this. One of the most important types of education is listening. But there are endless books, endless resources, books, blogs, media outlets, speakers, YouTube videos to help you learn. What you should not do, though, is expect those with whom you want to ally yourself to teach you. That is not their responsibility. Sure, listen to them when they decide to drop some knowledge or perspective, but do not go to them and expect them to explain their oppression for you. So study is, of course, crucial for revolutionaries. But the vision of self-education that we saw in that passage is isolating. Learning is modeled as consuming information. It's not a discussion. It's not coming to a common understanding. It's not studying the text and documents of a political tradition. It's totally disconnected from any kind of collective critical practice. It's detached from political positions or goals. Right? In this example, there are not even any criteria according to which one might evaluate all the books and blogs and YouTube videos. It's up to the individual ally to figure that out all on their own. The would-be ally can be scolded and shamed, even as the scolder is relieved of any responsibility for providing guidance and training. Because, I mean, look, it is not helpful to just tell someone to Google it. That's an empty gesture. Once we recall that the term ally is not a term of address, like no one says like, you know, ally Paul or something like that. It doesn't replace Mr. or Ms. or doctor as professor. So once we start realizing it's not a term like that, we can start to see that actually it designates a limit, suggesting you will never be one of us. 
does that more than it enables solidarity. The relation between allies and those they are allies for is between those who are considered as having fundamentally separate interests, experiences, and practices. One last example. The eighth item on Everyday Feminism's list of things allies need to know is <coughs> allies focus on those who share their identity. Quote, beyond listening, arguably the most important thing that I can do to act in solidarity is to engage those who share my identity, end quote. So it's not you know, like block, blockade a you know, oil rig or anything. It's engage those who share my identity. And in this version, identities appear as clear and fixed, like they're um, unambiguous, they're unchanging. Individuals are, are like little sovereign states, right, defending their territory and only joining together under the most cautious and self-interested terms. Those taken to share an identity are presumed to share a politics as if the identity were obvious and the politics didn't have to be built. Those willing to forward a politics other than one anchored in what can easily be ascribed to their identity are treated with suspicion, mistrusted for their presumed privilege, and criticized in advance for the array of wrongs that preserve that privilege. The very terms of allyship reinforce the mistrust that all these kind of how to be a better ally guides try to address. Because I mean, it does make sense to mistrust someone who views their politics in terms of immediate gratification as an individualized quick fix to long histories of structural oppression. Because allies join together under self-interested terms, they can easily withdraw, drop out, and let us down. We can't be sure of their commitment because it hinges on their individual feelings and comfort. So this item eight that I was talking about from the everyday feminism list tells us why um, allyship has had such a hold in progressive circles. Mistrust of other identities has become functional and gratifying in the name of a politics that maintains and polices identity as our own special and vulnerable thing. It shores up the weak and porous boundaries. So ally keeps attention away from the fearsome challenge of choosing a side, from accepting the discipline that comes from collective work, and from organizing the fight to smash capitalist imperialism and the divisive systems of bigotry and oppression that secure it. So allyship doesn't bridge political identities. It's a symptom of capitalism's attempt to replace politics with the techniques of individual self-help and social media moralism. The underlying vision is of self-oriented individuals, politics as possession, transformation reduced to attitudinal change, and a fixed, naturalized sphere of privilege and oppression. Anchored in a view of identity as the primary vector of politics, the emphasis on allies displaces attention away from strategic, organizational, and tactical questions and onto prior attitudinal litmus test, from the start precluding the collectivity necessary for revolutionary left politics. Now, just to make sure this is clear, of course those on the left need allies. Right? Sometimes it's necessary to forge temporary alliances in order to advance. Communist struggle necessitates a wide array of tactical alliances among different classes, sectors, and tendencies. So my critique of ally here is not a rejection of practices of alliance building, because that would be absurd. But what I'm trying to emphasize is allyship is not the form and model for the relation between those on the same side. It's not the model for revolutionary struggle against exploitation and oppression. As socialists and communists know, politics is always collective. The fiction that it's individual is just capitalist ideology. The attachment to individual identity that underpins the politics of allyship is thus a form of political incapacity. Instead of building and working in organizations capable of revolutionary struggle, allies turn to tend to concern themselves with defending their identities and lecturing others on how to aid in this defense. In contrast, because we embrace collective struggle, 
socialist and communist try to cultivate solidarity and comradeship. Unlike the separate and exclusive identities of allies, anyone, but not everyone, can be a comrade. Right? The term is generic. It doesn't refer to races or genders. It refers to those who share a politics, those on the same side who can be counted on. Where allyship is punishing, comradeship is disciplining. Expectations and the responsibility to meet them constrain individual action and generate collective capacity. Comrades learn to push immediate self-interest um, and, and desire for personal comfort aside for the sake of the struggle, the movement, the party, right? For the sake of our common goals. I think I'm gonna say, I wanna say just a little bit more about this discipline. Um, because the discipline of comradeship, well one, because discipline on the left has gotten kind of a bad rap, but the discipline of comradeship is super creative. It, it has a negative capacity and a creative capacity. On the one hand, it induces a kind of subordination of personal interest, but it does so for the sake of producing a new force, a force strong enough to endure the long years of revolutionary struggle and prevail. You know, Lenin um, famously and frequently spoke of the need for discipline in the Revolutionary Party. Rigorous discipline, proletarian discipline, iron discipline, socialist discipline, comradely discipline, and so on. Party discipline generally referred to the expectations of unity in action, free discussion, and criticism. Proletarian or labor discipline differed insofar as it pointed to the new organization of labor under socialism, the voluntary organization of class conscious workers. Through comradely discipline, we make one another stronger. Our commitment to working together toward our common goal works back on us, enabling us to surmount and maybe even abolish those individualist attributes produced by capitalism. We can make mistakes, learn and change. By recognizing our own inadequacies, we come to understand the need to be generous and understanding toward the shortcomings of others. We develop an appreciation for strengths and talents that we might have been unable to see. So we become a new kind of collectivity. Now there's different attributes besides discipline for the comrade, but I think um, I'll um, let that come for the Q&A so that we can, um, can, yeah, so I can just move to a conclusion and we can talk about that later. So to sum up, I've presented the comrade as a term of address, carrier of expectations, and form of political belonging. The, and, and, and defined it in terms of the egalitarian relation between those on the same side of a political struggle. And I've contrasted the comrade with four other forms of belonging, kin, neighbor, citizen, and friend. I've also argued that today our struggle requires that we be more than allies, that we be comrades. Comrades do more than express solidarity with the struggles of others. We take the struggle against oppression and for liberation, equality, and justice to be our struggle, to mark the side that we are on, the politics that unites us. Commitment to this struggle makes comrades strong, and this strength means that together we will win. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jody. We have time for a few questions. And just raise your hand and I'll bring you the mic. Not everybody at once, though. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Comrade Jody. Um, I had a question about the way that um, socialist and communist politics are structured and um, maybe like some of the shortcomings of the 20th century um, attempts to build a socialist subject of politics. Um, there's an ambiguity in the Marx and Engels uh, in the political sort of strategizing about how you build a sense of comradeship between people who have different interests, or whether or not the communist movement is about a group of people who have the same interests imposed by class society, who therefore uh, come together and mobilize politically in order to overturn the way that things currently are. Um, my question is when political interests are apparently at a certain level diverse among the group of people that should potentially be on your side as a comrade, how do you go about you know, forming the kinds of solidarity without this discourse of allyship? 
Yeah, thanks for that question. So um, I'll just do a first start, and if you want to follow up, you know, we can, it doesn't have to just be this little one-way thing, right? Um, so the first thing is, let's just make a difference between, let's say, the party and the movement. And uh, movement people come together in a lot of ways for all sorts of different reasons. Some it might be because of their interests, some might be because they're bored, some maybe their friends are doing it, it's cool, whatever. But, but with a movement, there's just like massive amounts of dispersed interest. And we wouldn't say, or I wouldn't say, that everybody in the movement are comrades with each other, right? I think comrade is a much um, more rigorous, disciplined relation. And we would, I would think about those in the same party. And so once you're in the same party and you're party comrades, your interests are the collective interest of the party. So that's what your interests are. And that's, separate, that's different from the multitudinous interest of the movement. Does that answer? Yeah. yeah. Does he need a mic or do you want not want to let him? Other people have their hands up. Oh, oh it's my bad. Thank you. So, um, so the the, I, the concept of comrade, right, especially in the 20th century, is really actually the political belonging is also attached to the uh, organized organized social movement in a form mm -hmm. of a communist party. Mm -hmm. Now, would you say that allies become something that is um, more popular today because of the lack or the absent of, and when I say co absent of communist party, in, it is unlike the early 20th century where we have Comintern, commun mm -hmm. my research is about communist movement in, in Indonesia, for example, in the Dutch East Indies in 1920s. So they use Kamerat, for example, and today without the this political belonging of the international communism, I think then the word camera also becomes not irrelevant, but it's hard for people to use it. So I wonder if in order for us to be able to use comrade, we should also create the movement, the, the organization yes. that it needs. And so absolutely, I fully agree with you. And one of, the, one of my hopes for this project um, is to remind people of the strength that comes from the intense unified organizations like a party. Right, that, that there is something missing in the wide differentiated movement approach that has been so dominant, um, just let's say since 89. Um, that, that, that essentially there's a version of the left that doesn't seem like it's missing anything, that just will say, well, we're fragmented as if that's just the way it is. And I think that if we can um, start to recognize you know, the power and strength of comradeship and also the, the intense um, the, it's in t the intense gratification that it also provides through the struggle that, um, the, the, that, that I can name what's missing, and then that would also incite people more to recognize the importance of a party. And so I fully agree. <laughs> So it sounds like your, com your conceptualization of comrade is somebody specific who, who belongs to a party entity. But historically speaking, communist parties have possessed vanguards and degrees of power within the party. Um, so I'm curious how comrade, as you understand it, can speak to the realities historically of differentiation within a party structure. Um, so I think that one thing to say is that that there is a differentiated structure doesn't mean that the people in the party aren't comrades, right? It doesn't mean the differentiated function that people play out doesn't mean that they're not fully equal, right? It just means that they're playing different roles that, the requ that are required by the organization. Now, is it the case that historically this didn't always go well? <laughs> Sure, I, I think, you know, there, sometimes there were drawbacks. Um, but, but, for, but we can still recognize and understand the importance of being able to carry out functions. And the fact that that someone has one function doesn't mean that they are more equal than people who are doing other kinds of work. So I think, so I wouldn't want to, I, I don't want to say that the fact of differentiation erases comradeship or even makes it suspect at all. I think it's, it's much more like saying, no, 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 we have to recognize to get things done, we're going to have to do different kinds of work at different kinds of moments. I feel like I want to spread things in this, this direction. Oh, Is that's right. Hey, y'all over here. Over here that wants to ask a question? 
No? Another okay. Quiet side. What about? Yeah? Do you want to let him finish his follow up? Yeah, sure. No? Oh, no, he's like, no, don't call me. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that. Sorry, thank you. The crux of sort of my question comes partly from um, this kind of stupid, like, um, very uh, economist sort of like perspective of people like the End Notes Committee who wrote um, uh, Anatomy of a Failure, that sort of like long 20th century anatomy of why certain socialist movements might have collapsed before they gained power. And their problem was that there's an ambiguity between uh, a kind of politics which teaches people that their interests lies in a particular way. So, for instance, the traditional idea of the proletariat is someone who has quasi-generic interests, quasi-universal interests, and therefore, by coming together, they will destroy the particular interests that constitute society and that sort of thing. But that sometimes it's difficult to convince people that those are their real political interests, that we have, like, you know, the Marxist irony of the real insight into what someone's political interests are because we understand the class structure, whereas there are genuine political interests that do not align with that. And the example that I would give is, you know, I was having a conversation with some friends of mine, all from different backgrounds, and they said that they had a problem with the POC movement because it treated people of colour as a hegemonic block. Oh, sorry, a homogenous block that didn't have individuation. And not wanting to <laughs> necessarily overstep my boundaries as the only white person at the table, I was sort of like, well, you know, you all have the same political interest in overcoming white supremacy. And in that sense, it's a movement that is separate from individual interests. So, I mean, but this is the ambiguity that I'm sort of like worrying about, uh, whether or not we have any sort of privileged insight into what someone's real political interests are. So I would first say, I think it's always going to be very difficult to, like, for one, let me, let me say three things. Like one thing, I mean, politics are always going to be hard, right? So that something is really difficult. That's just like, that's just the way it is. So that's one. Um, second, I think, next thing is that, um, when we're talking and thinking and working with respect to movements, um, movements bring people from who have really differentiated um, positions together and only rely on a kind of convergence of interest. And comradeship involves something else, right? Comradeship is going to be a set of conviction, an understanding that we are on the same side and that we have the same principles that we're fighting for. And so then at that point, that's where comradeship comes in. But the kind of debate that you're talking about, I mean, that's a real debate. But I also think it's, it's, it's very easy to um, kind of make sort of generalizations about this part of the movement and that part of the movement. And then you lose the differentiation, which is actually why people have different views going into it to begin with. So I think that it's actually, I find it super helpful to, to keep the, the kind of categories sort of separate and recognize the benefits of, let's say, the kind of, of intense collectivity that a party offers and that comradeship offers that's not going to be the same thing. And it's not for everybody, right? Not everybody, basically, not, every, not everybody who talks a radical game is really to make the sacrifice. So. <clears throat> Uh, thanks, Comrade Jody. Oh. Um, <clears throat> I was wondering, sort of along the lines of your last point there, uh, <clears throat> you know, I was organizing in, a, if, f organizing in a socialist party 15 years ago to see, to hear the word comrade, people would kind of, you know, chuckle that anyone would, would use such an old term. And now, like on Twitter, you see comrade constantly. And Twitter, I mean, I mean not just Twitter, all social media, people say, well, so-and-so is a comrade almost like I agree with them, or I think they post pretty cool stuff very often, or it seems that we have something in common. Um, whereas I think, yeah, that, that historical definition was obviously based on something that was earned, and it sort of suggested that this person is on my side in a way that I can trust them uh, over the long haul, almost regardless of whether you know them. If you know someone is a comrade in another city or another or even another country if in, the, in the period of the common term, you kind of know they're on your team no matter what and through thick and thin, at least that was the elan the of the term. So I wonder if you think that actually the growing popularity of the term comrade has any dangers within it. Um, I, 
I actually think no. I don't think it's dangerous. And the reason why is I think it's part of the kind of massive change in the milieu that has made socialism popular again, that has made it so that like you don't have to worry about being red baited in the same way you did even five or six years ago, that there is now a new broad milieu and that that is good. Now, in, in sort of everyday life, does it mean that everybody who calls us comrade that we can necessarily rely on? No. But We'll only know that you know, in the course of practical action and see. But I think overall that we should champion and really be excited and supportive about a much broader milieu um, where, where people use these languages and these terms and this is where the inspiration's coming from. I mean, I, a part of me thinks is like, oh my God, you know, what if it's sort of like you know, New York in the 30s where like everybody, every single person was a communist. I mean, maybe they weren't, but it seemed like it, right? When you read that exciting material, like, I mean, you've got communists and fellow travelers and people Really, it's in the air in a great way. So I want to, I want to say for now, we'll see. Like in three years, maybe it'll be like, oh my God, that's like really gone overkill. But I think right now, I'm, um, I, I'm, I'm going to push for the positive side of it. Oh, okay. I think we've got time for one or two more. Hi. Yeah, I'm wondering about like, I've been in organizations where um, people understand the importance of discipline, but it's like kind of puts a damper on enthusiasm, mm -hmm. you know, like people with an attitude like, wow, why is everyone showing up late? Or how have we not already done this? Or why aren't we better? And it's like, um, bums people out. And like, people are really committed and want to work hard, but it doesn't feel like they're doing it from, it's like not that empowering anymore. And it's like, um, I don't know how to mm -hmm. navigate that, I guess, in organizations I'm in. Oh, I think that that's such a, a great point, and I wish I had like a great answer, but I, but I don't. I mean, I I think of actually in my um, the sort of um, four attributes of a comrade. I think that of discipline, joy, enthusiasm, and courage, and I think they all they all go together and are intertwined. But it is it's not always easy to keep them together, um, and I think those you know. And organizers have all sorts of different, you know, ways that we try to do that, right? So better practical tasks that keep people engaged. Um, that's usually a good one. Um, I actually think that's better than sort of navel gazing and thinking about what the problems are. It's like more like, no, let's like, you know, raid something. Um, so I think that, um, you know, the, the drawbacks are real. It can be really hard. But I, I, I would want to try to say that part of discipline is actually trying to maintain enthusiasm. And that if rather than that discipline puts a damper on it, it might be that it's the kind of lack of discipline that's actually putting the damper on it. Maybe. Thank you for that excellent talk. Hi. I was reading um, yesterday um, some excerpts from the Red Book. <laughs> And Mao has, you know, the quotes, and he's, there's a section on comrade, and he talks about um, it's very important for a really a, a good comrade to be flexible, and to be open, and to be patient, and to be loving, and to not castigate another comrade. Um, they sh there should be a place for open, constructive feedback. So this stereotype of the comrade, you know, he's, he's rebutting all of that and saying, no, that's not what, you know, that it's all about discipline and castigation and, you know, it's all centralism and no democracy, but rather this openness and reflection and I, I'm, I think Che Guevara talked about that too. It's really being a human being um, and um, thinking about people's needs and finding the best in the individual. It's not, yeah. I, um, I like very much what you said about flexibility. And what I would do is say, like, like actually, I think being, f like being flexible is actually depends on a kind of discipline, right? Like, I mean, this, honestly, I'll just, at the risk of oversharing, this is really hard for me because I'm, like, a super rigid person. It's like everything's got to be like this. And so, like, pr trying to be, you know, a better comrade means just lighten up, for crying out loud, Jody, right? Like, you need to be more flexible and recognize it's not always going to go 
right? Like like this every single time. So I think that um, that what we need to that that it's that it's good to kind of start to see that these that it's not like it's flexible or discipline. It's not like it's democratic or centralist. It's not like it's like, you know, responsive or hardcore, right? They, they're part of the same kind of bucket of things. And I think when I loved the list that you gave because it makes us also recognize the real difference in um, political associations that have those sets of values as opposed to the stuff like allyship where it's like, you know, nagging on people you don't even know. Right for like no reason other than showing that you like are woke or something, and and so the ones that you're describing really are talk about how it is that we work together in order to be a strong instrument. Okay, so the last question has arrived, and I'm walking over to you. Uh, hey. Um, I was wondering, in a previous work of yours, Democracy and Other Neoliberal Fantasies, uh, you talk about the left's adoption of the language of victimization mm -hmm. as being tied to like an abdication of the respons political responsibility to lead and to govern. And it seems like this idea of allyship, as you're presenting it now, is tied to that as well. I wonder if you see this sort of this project of reasserting the importance of this idea of comradeship as being tied to reclaiming that responsibility to lead and to govern? Oh, God, that's such an interesting and smart question. I had not, I mean, I had not like sort of thoughtfully, you know, that, oh, that's the way I'm going to do that, right? Um, I hadn't thought of that, but I think you've got to be right, right? It has to be the case, right? What, um, because it, and like, it means like, what is it, if we really want to think about leadership in the left, what kind of leadership do we want? We certainly don't want something like, I don't know, like, like one guy yelling at everybody, right? That's not what we want. And so anything that's going to be a kind of leadership that we would want would have to be collective and come out of a kind of how the collectivity is itself becoming strong together, right? The relations between those as we build up a kind of collective leadership. So I think, yeah, it's got to be that, 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 that that's the, the kind of the, uh, mental trajectory and how the left becomes like, stronger as leaders. So I appreciate um, that. Thank you for that. Thanks so much. Well, thank you so much, Jody. I hope people join me in thanking you for a really thank wonderful so. talk. Um, and thank you so much for coming. Can I say again, our, our friends at Word Up have copies of Comrade out from Verso. I think Jody would be happy to sign sure. a copy. Um, so please um, do. And uh, thanks again. And I hope to see you back at TPF.